We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words from the Declaration of Independence are familiar to many of us, and yet it took 143 years for women to get the right to vote, and 189 years for black people to get the right to vote. And still today, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are still only words for many people. Here in Boston, Life expectancy varies by 30 years, depending on where you live. In Roxbury, with many poor and black people, life expectancy is 59 years. In the Back Bay, wealthy and mostly white, life expectancy is 91 years. It's tough to have liberty when you are in prison. The United States incarcerates 716 people for every 100,000 people. Our rate of incarceration is more than five times higher than most countries in the world. Millions of people in our country don't have health care, a decent job, good education, a home they can afford, and that makes it pretty hard to pursue happiness. So on this show, you are going to meet people who are making it possible to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People today who are making the words of the Declaration of Independence come true. Hello, my name is Michael Jacoby Brown, and we're very lucky today to have on our show, we hold these truths, a uh, great social justice organizer, my friend, and soon to be yours, Horace Small. Welcome, Horace. Mike, it's a pleasure Hi. seeing you again, brother. Thanks for coming here. Thank you. No, thank you. It's an honor. Uh, we're honored to have you. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit, Horace, about uh, where you were born and what your upbringing was and what led well, you to have the values that you have I get today. In, how, in other words, how did I get into becoming a professional troublemaker? Well, yeah, I, yeah, exactly. That would be easy enough. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a kid from West Philadelphia. Um, my father taught a class at Temple University, but he also worked at the post office, like other good black men of that generation. My mother was a nurse, and she was the first black director of nurses of a hospital in the city of Philadelphia, Misery Co at uh, uh, Metropolitan Hospital. So I basically was raised black middle class, <clears throat> and I was also raised black Republican, because remember, you know, Lincoln freed the slaves, we owed them one, and kind of deal. Um, and then the, you know, and even even when I was a kid, my father was active in the civil was active in the mm. civil rights struggle. Like I, like I did go. I was one of the young kids that did go to the march on Washington. Really, but really. the thing that I that 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 got me into this for real, because what I remember about the march on Washington it was the hottest day ever, and I couldn't buy enough ice cream. But I did know <laughs> Dr. King was speaking, and everybody listened to that. But um, yeah, what got me into this work was my cousin. My cousin got killed in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And um, he was my role model, and he was the person that I always ran to when I got on my parents' nerves, my sister's nerves, and everybody else's nerves. He was, he was always a friend. Mm -hmm. So when Roland checked out uh, in Nam, you know, it, it, I was 12, 13, we started a thing called Students Against the War. The person that got me into this was a guy by the name of Bob Brand, who was an organizer. Mm -hmm. Uh, for, um, I forgot the name of the organization, but he was at the University of Pennsylvania, he was a student, and it was mm -hmm. the, to organize on, against the war. And mm -hmm. um, so he gave me a place where I could go to, you know, and put my 12, 13, 14 year old mind to work. So besides mm -hmm. playing sports, we did this. Right. So and that's how I got involved yeah. in this. And, and I know, uh, what was that like? I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about what happened during, with your experience during the war in Vietnam? Oh, war, I, I know you went to prison eventually. Yeah, yeah, um, it was, um, it, well, when I was doing the work, one of the things they taught us to do was they taught us how to be draft counselors. Hmm. So one of the things that was really interesting was that, you know, here are all these like 12, 13, 14, 15 year old kids talking to college kids, you know, about, about what their options were mm -hmm. and what they needed to do if they wanted to get student deferment, uh, uh, CO deferment, or what have you. So um, I did that. But mm -hmm. when it came to my turn to register for a draft, I just didn't. I was like, 
you know, no big deal. I'm going to like, I'm going to college. Uh, I'm going to play ball, uh, and I'm going to be involved in, uh, in, in, in student issues. And um, so what happened was when I was 19, I just so happened to be going out with, the, with uh, my girlfriend was the head of, was the daughter of the registrar. And um, he was also the draft counselor, Dr. Van Cleve. And we were going out together and she said, well, you know, if um, things started to look like they were peaking, starting to perk up. She says, you know, maybe they just started this thing called, called the, the lottery. And so maybe, um, maybe if you, if you register, you know, getting the lottery, you don't have to worry about this. So that's what I did. I went back to Philly when I Christmas break, I registered. They said, you're late. I said, yeah, I know. And they said, well, if you probably, if you, you know, we probably wouldn't have caught you if you hadn't registered. So I registered for the draft. I was eligible for the next, um, uh, lottery, which was that February, and my number was four. So <laughs> you were getting drafted, right? So I was getting. Dra I heard from the draft board like like two days later, yeah. and then I began this this journey of of um, of um, you know writing my. I had to write a. I wrote a nine page paper to the draft board about why I felt I. I couldn't serve because I don't believe in killing anything. You know me. I don't. I don't. Yeah, right. I don't kill bugs, right? You know, my wife better hope that 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 God's not a lobster. That's all right. I know because she's thrown a lot in pots. I can't do it. Right. But um, I went through all that. Went through the hearing. Went through you know about all the draft stuff I needed. And the next thing I know, I was in Lewisburg. So <laughs> that was it. And for the next five and a half, six months, I was working to. Uh, with other CEOs, you know, who are, mm -hmm. who, are, who are behind the wall, you know, helping guys get their GEDs and, and, and things like that. So you could have gone to Canada or someplace else like some people well, did. I what did, led you, you know, to I do did, what you did? You know, I, at the time you didn't think of it, honestly, because, you know, there, there was so much going on mm -hmm. and there was so much that that you felt you were going to lose like for instance you know th the relationship that i had with my father which was mm -hmm. i always thought was kind of strained from the beginning mm -hmm. ceased to exist at that point you know because mm -hmm. i felt like when i needed him he was not there wow. and 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 that and the tragedy is that stayed that way through the rest of his life and he just died a couple of years ago yeah, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you know we had no connection no relationship uh the purported shame that it brought on the family was something that people didn't really talk about. Um, mm. You know, the sense that my father was World War II, so you're a coward, yeah. you know, and, and he mm. couldn't understand that, that, that the principle is nonviolence and a commitment to nonviolence is probably far more powerful than, than, than picking up a gun or hitting someone with your fist. It's, 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 it's a profound belief that, you know, I, mm. I don't kill anything. And, you know, and, and with that said, like, I, shoot, I'm against the next hundred billion trillion skillion wars. So that's just the way I'm cut out. And, mm. uh, but, but family-wise, mm. we lost a lot. I lost a lot. Yeah. Yeah, but I was 19. When am I going? Yeah, I was yeah. 19, 20. Was well, can, can you tell, uh, tell us, you know, after that, you, I know, got involved with the Philadelphia City Council and oh, well, I got lots involved of other in, organizing. Can you tell us well, we of started what this thing some called, of the things you uh, well, did we, after that, after well, you came well, out? Well, I came prison. home. Well, the yeah. thing that, that, one of the things, and I think if you talk to most people who were CEOs, uh, whether they went to jail or whether they're not, you know, because the struggle that you went through, like, I, th th to this day, I still remember getting a small booklet talking about life in a federal penitentiary, what, you know, to help influence you in your decision on what you're going to do. Um, yeah, we came home more committed to this thing called social mm -hmm. justice than ever. Started a program called Young Adults United for Community Progress, started working with young people and what have you. And then uh, the Carter campaign called. Hmm. And said, look, you know, we need somebody to, you know, we would like to bring you, we'd like to talk to you about being the Minority Affairs, one of the Minority Affairs coordinators from Pennsylvania. So I went to work with the Carter Mondale campaign, and the, the chairman of the campaign was a state senator from Massachusetts, a guy by the name of Joe Timothy. Hmm. 
who I thought was the coolest white man I ever met. Mm. Um, you know, he was the epitome of somebody who racially got it, mm. um, who could operate in a lot of, uh, mm. of different circles and communities with ease. Mm. And, um, you know, and, and he also taught us. He taught a lot, a, a mm. much of what I learned about the game of, because it's really kind of a game in many ways, mm. you know, is, is uh, you know, I learned from him. Really? And we ended up, you know, we won Pennsylvania by hair because at the time you could register voters who weren't convicted of a statewide crime. So you had people right. all locked up in prison and the whole bit because they couldn't afford bail. You know, we registered them and we got them out and we, we registered them, got them absentee ballots, they voted. And Carter won Pennsylvania by less than 1%. Wow. And what were some of those lessons that Timothy taught you? What did he say or do that he said he, you know, got Well, I think, you know, I think the, the biggest lesson that we learned, I mean, one of the, the, the thing I learned is that if that organizing is political, all organizing is political. What do you mean? Well, when you bring community people together to talk about it, you know, when you, they come together, they talk about issues. Mm -hmm. They begin to start talking about things that really matter to them, mm -hmm. uh, that, 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 that they tell you are, are, are something that's actually impacting the quality of life in their community. Mm -hmm. So you have to determine what's the difference between a problem and what's an issue, and they would tell you that. Mm -hmm. So they tell you, like, if recreation was a pro or lack of recreational opportunities was a, was a problem for kids and kids had absolutely no place to go, then the challenge for us as organizers working with community people is to come up to a solution to the problem. So the solution, so what is the solution? The solution could possibly be more funding for, you know, community programs. Mm -hmm. It could possibly be engaging citizens to say, well, what is it that we want to do mm -hmm. that's going to benefit these kids? Maybe we start sports programs, maybe you start after school programs, whatever the kids, you, you have to come up with solutions. You know, showing a movie on a right. Thursday night, you know, whatever the solution and is. And Timothy was involved in that stuff, not just well, getting, Tim Timothy, getting people elected. Timothy talked about, well, the important, what Joe talked about was the importance of listening to uh, people, okay, right? That's key. To come up, yeah. you know, listening to people. Really? Listen to their needs and concerns wow. and provide them, you know, and, and what organizing does, it provides people mm -hmm. the roadmap in order to take control of their lives and to, and to, and to address the problems that they're concerned about. Mm -hmm. The organizer brings people together, essentially functions as a cheerleader, you know, helps them, helps them, you know, helps them believe in their skills, mm -hmm. helps them believe in their capacity to do things. It helps them learn how to structure. You know, a good organizer helps you structure things, you know, to get, you know, so that things can get done, so you can measure your progress. Yeah, that's unusual in an electoral campaign. Right, Most well, electoral campaigns are, vote for me and I'll take it from well, here. Well, the thing is, you know, but Paul Wellstone did the same thing. Right, yeah. You know, and Paul was a dear friend, and he was a brilliant organizer mm -hmm. in Minnesota. The things that he did in rural Minnesota are still talked about, but it all comes down to talking to people Listening, listening to them, to people, listening to yeah. them, you know, and 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 helping them because one of the things that you always had, you always heard was, well, we can't, right? You know, we can't. Well, you don't think we can get ten people to the meeting next right, week? We tried it before. Right? Yeah, yeah, you know, we've done this before. Okay, I said, well, let's make a deal. All right. Well, what are you willing to do to get to help us get ten people there? Right. So, is, are anybody here willing to bring three people for the right. next meeting? I mean. You know, it's right. it's 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 challenging them, but friendly. Right. You know, hearing not them. asking them to bring yeah. thirty, but three. Right. Thirty, forget right. it. Right. But three, hearing maybe. Them. Yeah. But hearing them, hearing them, and hearing their concerns, mm -hmm. and then reminding them each time we had a success. See, I told you we could do it. Yeah. No, see, I told true. you, I told you we could do this. I told you we could do it. Well, they got to see it for themselves. Yeah. And ultimately, like, okay, so now if we're talking about the change, I remember one of the, one of the hardest things that you had to convince people was some of the simplest thing in the world was getting a stop sign. Right. right, you know, sign a petition, we go downtown, we get a stop sign. But to help people go, well, they're not gonna listen to us, they never listen to us, they don't listen right. to anything in this community. And then right. you pull it off, then you show right. them how to do it. 
Right. I mean, you walk them through. You know, you yeah. know, you like, well, let's, well, it says here that we have to do this, this, and this. So we need a petition. So who's willing to write a petition? Do you know what a petition is? Yeah, well, you know, sign the name, blah, 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 make a statement, blah, and we do that. And, um, you know, and that's, and that's, the, that's the organizing, quite honestly, Michael. Mm -hmm. I miss, I miss that mm. grassroots, you know, that, that, that let's organize this block, then we go over to the next block. That's what we, when we stopped the drug trafficking in Philadelphia back in the late 80s, early 90s, that was the model that was used. Mm -hmm. You know, organize works. blocks, chase them to the next block, and just keep organizing these blocks. Well, you've been here in Massachusetts now for over 20 years, and I know you uh, founded and led the Union of Minority Neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about some of the lessons and some of the work you've done there, here in, uh, in Massachusetts with the Union of Minority Neighborhoods. Uh, I have always thought of, this has been some of the harder work I've done. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. There's, there's culture, there's mm. class, there's race. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you know, one of the first things that we had to handle <clears throat> when we first started was the idea that, 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 that black people actually have the ability to do this because, mm -hmm. like, the general sense was the role of white organizers was to save everybody else, right? right? And so I remember going to a funder uh, with an emerging board member. And we talked about you know, the things that we were doing, that we were really doing, oh, yeah. and that we were doing like for nothing. Because when you're an organizer, you know how to make things happen with nothing, because you're used to having nothing. You work right. with poor people, poor people don't have anything. Right. And the guy said, we, I said I was lying. He said right. I was lying. Now, the Philly in me was like, now I gotta get up and beat the bejesus out of this white man. But, <laughs> right, right? But the, 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 um, um, the, the non-violent heart. Yeah, the non-violent heart. It's like, but this is what we had to mm. deal with. Mm. And it was with all the Boston Foundation, with all these various foundations, the reason why a lot of black organizations weren't getting funded was because the foundations didn't value the work. Or mm. we didn't have the same we didn't have the same grant writers writing, you know, flowery proposals that, that, that they like. Or that, you know, that, well, if we don't see it, because we're never in your neighborhoods, if we don't see it, then it can't be real. Mm -hmm. And so that was a constant fight. So everything from, from when, when, uh, um, when Mitt Romney decided to kill affirmative action, mm -hmm. you know, we forced him to put it back. It took 10 days. But, you know, we forced them to put it back by pulling together constituencies from around the state saying, no, this, this, this can't happen. And we mm -hmm. did it with nothing. Right. Um, we, we kept the Ben Franklin Institute from being closed because Menino wanted to sell the property and put the money in the, uh, in, uh, the, in the city's bank account. We're like, no, you can't do that. Kids, go here. You know, the real right. kids go here, and 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 the, and the school's not in any any financial crises. It's just that you want to sell the building that was owned by state. We right. backed them off of that. Quarry reform was mm -hmm. something you yeah. know that we started, and we started with nothing. We had absolutely nothing. Right. Um, Can you explain what that is? Not everybody, certainly a lot of white people, including myself, well, didn't know that Corey wasn't a girl's name. Yeah, that well, uh, I, that's what I thought at yeah, first. Right. I was like, I just hope to God I'd never meet her. But the, the reality was that, that Corey was a, is, is your, basically a criminal record. Yeah, criminal offender yeah, records yeah, index. Information, uh, Corey, information, yeah, criminal right. Criminal offender records. what it stands for, right. Is what Corey stands for. And at the time, once you got it, you could never get rid of it. It stayed with you. Um, and it, it kept you from getting jobs. It kept you from getting housing. And it's a huge problem in the black community. Oh, it's, it's In the white world, as you would say, people never thought Well, you know, of, it's also it's, it's class. It's, yeah. Okay? Because the thing about it was there was a boatload of labor guys. There was a boatload of folks in Southie, Charlestown. There's a boatload of labor, you know, pe kids, people in Taunton, you know, East Bridgewater, white, you know, what we refer to as white world. Right. 
that were affected the exact mm -hmm. same way. Couldn't get jobs. Right. In fact, Tom Riley ran for governor, and he had a Corey from when he was back in the day. So, you know, when, when he ran against Deval Patrick, and he was the attorney general. So, you know, the, the, the challenges that we had to, had, that we had to work through uh, in order to get people to pay attention to uh, the work. The first thing we did was we were able to convince Mayor Menino that people deserve second chances. Mm -hmm. So the strategy was let's win citywide. Let's win a citywide effort so that at least in the city of Boston, people with criminal records can, can move on. Mm -hmm. um, and we did that. So we, we got that done. Then it was on to statewide legislation, which took roughly about seven or eight years. It took about seven or eight years to convince the legislature that people not only deserve second chances, um, but they deserve a life. And, and what worked to convince legislators? What was effective? In, in my theory of organizing, you have to use, you have to use multiple tactics uh -huh. at the same time, right? You have to talk to the faith community about like, this is wrong, we need you to get mm -hmm. behind this. You have to talk to, you know, we talked to the Greeks, you know, the, the black fraternal organizations. We talked to firefighters. Or said another way, you know, our strategy is and our saying is we will talk to Lottie, Dottie, right. any damn body right. <clears throat> in order to get to where we needed to get to. Mm -hmm. And ultimately what we built was we built a we built we were influential in building a statewide movement of folks mm -hmm. that brought broad constituencies together saying this needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. And it was at that point. It was at that point that um, that they decided to change because the problem that we had, mm -hmm. you know, it took eight years because the problem that we had was, um, Finneran was the was the was the speaker, mm -hmm. and he gave all his committee chairs full power to do whatever they wanted. And in our world, the judiciary chair was a guy by the name of Eugene O'Flaherty from Malden, who was not, <coughs> who was law for he was a law and order type. And as long, we had the votes on the committee, we had the votes in the House. But as long as he was the chair, and as long mm. as we had prison guards, who we found out prison guards like really have a powerful union in the state. When the prison guards were telling them, no, we don't want this because we'll lose our jobs if this happens. You know, we had to fight that and that took almost eight years. And the thing that was also really helpful was a sister by the name of Gladys Vega, because mm. Gladys Vega, um, is the queen of Chelsea. I know. Right. And my dear sister, I love her to death. And she, and, and the one area that was represented by Eugene O'Flaherty was Chelsea. So it just so happens that election, I think it was uh, Obama, 2012, um, it was that election that Chelsea, you know, had officially had enough immigrants that have moved in who were then eligible to vote. Right. Which is a problem for Eugene O'Flaherty. Right. So Eugene O'Flaherty went along with the legislation. And right. that's how we were able, <coughs> excuse me, to yeah, get it done. That's helpful. Now, I know you recently left being executive director of the yeah. Union of Minority Neighborhoods. Uh, if you, you know, look back on all those years, what are uh, some of the lessons you would like to pass on to younger organizers who are taking up the work now? Read newspapers. Okay, that's a start. I mean, that's a start. The few that are left, for, right? For, you know, well, I mean, like you know, I start. I, I'm thinking that this is millennial organizing kryptonite. Okay, yeah. you know, you have to read newspapers. You have to read periodicals. You have to read books. You have to, you have to be engaged in the world broadly and know what's going on. Not just newspapers, Not, but books and I articles. Mean, yeah, well, yeah. yeah, I mean, you would, it would stand to reason, okay, because you've got to balance what community is telling you with the realities of what are taking place, mm. you know, in halls of government, in other communities as well. You know, you have to pay attention to that. Yeah. So, so, for instance, there's like, you know, we have um, Uber and those guys are trying to take away the rights of workers. It worked in California, right. so now they decided that you know they're coming to Massachusetts. Yeah, permanently taken away. They've already exactly. taken them away. Exactly, and you wanna... have to you know, and in order to understand that whole issue, 
you got to read about it. Mm -hmm. It's if, pretty complicated. It's pretty complicated, but you got to right. care about this thing. If, if you're worried about workers not getting unemployment, not getting you know uh, just wages, not having the protections that they need, you got to care. And that also means not only do you read the article that you saw on the paper, if you're going to work on that issue, you might want to read what happened in California. Mm -hmm. And find out from organizers what you know what worked, what didn't. So being really well informed is real is important. It's critical. What what else is real important? You I mean, to, you talked you, about listening earlier. Well, you have to. I mean, that's the second thing. The yeah. most important thing is listening. Mm -hmm. um, well, one, I think you have to absolutely be comfortable in yourself and in your abilities. Mm -hmm. So you have to know who you are, mm -hmm. what makes you tick. Because right. that's ultimately going to drive you as an organizer. Right, because if you're lucky, someone will ask you, what the hell are you yeah, doing Yeah, because someone's going to ask you. That's guaranteed. If you're lucky. Yeah. Because if you assume most of these people have heard this before. Right. If you've had somebody live on the street for 45 years, this is not the first time they talk about, let's pull a block committee together. Right. This is not the first time they heard that. Right. So you have to know who you are. Mm -hmm. And you have to be prepared to answer that question. On a deep level, and not deep, just my and, name's Horace Small. be real. Yeah. And be real because the most important thing that you find, what keeps people involved, if you're the facilitator trying to bring people in, they have to be comfortable around you. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you have to, and, and you have to be comfortable with all kinds of people. The chatty annies, the ones who sit in the corner who don't say much. But know gotta something, be prodded. Probably, yeah. Right. You know, the one who runs his mouth 24 7, and you gotta balance all of that. Mm -hmm. um, the third thing is practice your skills. Mm -hmm. Understand the difference between a tactic, which is an activity to help move your right. strategy along, and a strategy, your ultimate game plan. Right. How are you gonna get to where you need to go? You need to know the difference between the two. Right. And, you know, and, a, and a, a tactic is not a strategy. Strategy is a long-term plan. long-term game. A tactic is right? what we're doing this afternoon, press conference, whatever. But, there's a, but the other thing, too, is there's a billion tactics. Right. You know, it's not just marching. Because at some point, you keep marching, the only thing you're doing is going for a long walk. And that may ultimately be good for your health, but is it moving the issue along? Right. Of course not. And two, you got to, and there's also tactics that you've got to take people out of their comfort zone. So, for instance, if we know that we're going to march, well, the police know. They already know how to handle that. Mayor's office knows how to handle that. City council knows how to handle it. All the policy people know how to handle a march. Been there, done Been that. Been there, done that. Get on the bullhorn, blow smoke out your butt, go home. Right. What can you do to take them out of their comfort zone? What do you do to show that, like, it, you know, that maybe we go to the mayor's house? Something. Maybe we camp out in front of the mayor's house. Maybe we take over the state house steps and, like, put up tents and we camp out there. You know. That I mean, worked. Yeah, it works. Yeah. And maybe we, or, 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 or maybe we go to the bank. If we got issues with the bank and we're opening accounts, when we got accounts with, we're going to open an account with. It's $20 in pennies. Here you go. On each one. Lots There's of things. The, be creative. Be creative. Be creative and have fun with it because yeah. people have to, you know, you got to, it doesn't work if people don't own it. If the people you're working with don't own it, if they're not having fun with it, it doesn't they work. They ain't going to last. They ain't going to last. And then the other thing I think the most important thing too is recognizing that systemic change takes time. Takes time it takes, and takes time. organization. Yeah, it takes time. So if you're going to work on an issue, it's not going to be resolved in three weeks. No. It's not going to be resolved in a month. If you're going to work on it, you've got to plan for the long term. Right, and that's why we say organizers build organizations, well, organizations. and build leaders. And you, have to, and, and you take that time to do exactly that. So they begin to find their confidence in themselves. They begin to start taking on the skills. Yeah. Paris, thank you. I guess I ran my we mouth really, too much. No, you're just <laughs> enough. I'm Michael Jacoby Brown. We're really lucky to have had Horace Small, great organizer, the recently retired director of the Union of Minority Neighborhoods in Boston, Massachusetts. And thank you for tuning in.